war was over and people went wild. No more shooting, no more destruction. There would be peace. From San Francisco to New York, to London, to Paris, and to Moscow. In Russia, too, they celebrated. The war was over, and they showed their joy with a great military parade. Instead of dancing and singing, they marched. Well, each to his own taste, we thought. The war was over, and American soldiers and sailors couldn't get home soon enough. There were families waiting, and the greatest military machine in history melted as we laid aside our arms. We thought the nations of the world had learned that the ways of peace are richer than war. Russian soldiers, too, would probably have liked to go home to their families. But Soviet leaders decided otherwise. Russia had gone into Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Albania, and kept their military might to enslave these countries. The war was over. Of what use were military planes? In the United States, we set about destroying them more quickly than we made them. We used the metal to make pots and pans, bicycles and cars. The Russian leaders, too, wanted peace, they said. But they set about proving it in an odd way. They not only didn't destroy their planes, they kept on making more. The war was over, and from the sands of North Africa to the jungles of the South Pacific, the materials of war were left to rot. This is the happy price of peace. There was peace, yet in Moscow's Red Square, there was the ominous roar of the monsters of war. The war was over and the American people were glad to see the shells destroyed. Rockets burst as though joining the celebration. There was peace, and the Russians proudly pulled their biggest guns through the streets. The Soviet leaders said they were for peace, and this was their proof. The United States believed there was a better way to show their will to peace, over 10 million men were discharged from the armed forces. And in San Francisco, statesmen from 50 nations assembled to form the United Nations. From Europe, Asia, Africa, South and North America came men of goodwill. There was hope that at long last, men had learned that aggression leads only to war. The work done, they signed the United Nations Charter. To save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to promote social progress and better standards of life, 
in larger freedom, to practice tolerance and live together in peace. This was the great hope of mankind. Russia, too, signed the charter. In London, the United Nations got to work. It is not easy to undo the ravages of war. There was a great deal to do. Russia had emerged from the war in serious need of help. Through UNRWA committees like this one, the United Nations provided relief. Russia received hundreds of millions of dollars of help. Most of this help came from the United States. When the Soviets get something for nothing, they're happy and cooperative. Shiploads of goods from America started pouring into Russia. American ships with American goods for the Russian people to help them recover from the wounds of war, to help them build a peaceful and richer life. From America came tractors to plow the Russian wheat fields so the Russians could have bread. Boilers, tractors, motors, tools, medicines, leather, cloth, food, seeds, fertilizer. From the factories and fields of the United States, a flood of goods poured into Russia and filled thousands of warehouses. The United States wasn't the only country that helped Russia. From Brazil came food. From Canada, Great Britain, Australia, India, and many other democratic nations scattered all over the world. Goods were given to Russia to help feed the Russian people and to rebuild her factories her cities, and her farms. From ship, to warehouse, to wagon, to store. Canned milk from the United States in a Russian store. And Papa Stalin smiles. And while Russia's leaders cynically accepted our aid to help rebuild, they continued to plan for world conquest. For peace, the world needs more food. The United Nations decided to work for more food. Russia walked out on this work. Relief is temporary. What the world needs is more food production. The United Nations set up the Food and Agricultural Organization to help with advice and information. FAO observers traveling in various countries show farmers how to grow more food, better food. The more food, the greater the chances for peace. Russia wanted peace, she said, but she wouldn't join in this work. The children of the world need more milk. Russia would not join in the work to achieve more milk. Growing bigger hogs produces more meat. All the nations of the world gain by working together through FAO. Russia refused. Second only to food is the problem of health.
Russia wouldn't join in the work of the World Health Organization. The war left millions of children in need of medical care. Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, Denmark, Greece, Poland, Hungary, and many other nations have benefited from WHO. Disease has no respect for geographic boundaries, but Russia would not join in this work. Another problem was the refugees, war victims with no place to go. Again, there was the empty Russian chair. The UN set up the International Refugee Organization to give these people new hope for life. It taught them new trades to earn a living. It taught their children the language of the new lands they were going to. The International Refugee Organization gave hundreds of thousands of innocent victims of war a chance to start a new life. The IRO chartered a large fleet of ships, and more than 80 countries welcomed the refugees. Soviet Russia didn't admit a single one. Instead, she enslaved untold millions of Czechs, Hungarians, Germans, Poles, Greeks, Bulgarians. Over a quarter of a million refugees have already entered the United States. Russia didn't lift a finger to help. Russia has not joined in any of these works for peace. The United States has joined in all. There's an old proverb, actions speak louder than words. There have been other ways in which the American people have worked for peace. One of the most important is the Marshall Plan. The nations of Europe needed American help. In Paris, statesmen got together to plan the economic recovery of Europe. Ernest Bevin represented Great Britain. Molotov came from Russia. There was danger of economic chaos in Europe and help was needed. The United States and the nations of Europe were ready to cooperate but the Russians walked out. The nations of Western Europe went ahead without Russia, and soon the Marshall Plan goods started coming. Europe needed machines, steel, coal, generators, locomotives. Bridges and roads needed to be rebuilt. The whole of a war-torn economy had to be put back together again. Temporary relief was not enough. What was needed was to help Europe back on its feet again. Without help, there was danger of chaos. Russia called American help to Europe warmongering. The Russians called rebuilding of houses warmongering. With the help of the Marshall Plan, railroads were electrified to save coal. War-torn roads were rebuilt. Working together, the Marshall Plan countries helped each other. Factories were rebuilt to make tires, wheels, 
gears, pistons, nails. All these were needed for recovery. To grow more food, irrigation canals and dams were built. Ships and docks were built. To survive, Europe needs to trade across the waters. Now, at the end of three years, European agriculture, industry, exports and trade have greatly increased. And the damage of war is fast disappearing. Working together with the aid of the Marshall Plan, the nations of Europe have come a long way toward recovery. Recovery for peace. This is the Marshall Plan. Men and machines at work. Producing clothes, shoes, food, houses, machines. All over Europe, recovery was leading to new hope. And the Russians didn't like it. Remember Molotov walking out? When the Russian walkout failed to stop the Marshall Plan, orders went out to communist leaders to sabotage it. In France, the communist leader, Thorez, repeated the lines fed to him by his Russian bosses. In Italy, Togliatti incited the people to destruction and sabotage. All over Europe, the communists tried to stop economic recovery by strikes and riots. Why? Communists don't want recovery in Europe. They want poverty and chaos. In chaos, communists have the chance to seize power. To achieve power, they wrecked this train and killed many people. And burned this warehouse filled with Marshall Plan food. Let us see what happened in Germany after the war. The Nazi lies and aggression had led to war. And in the end, the German people paid a heavy price. Now, once again, the nations of the world would have another chance to work for peace. As in Japan, there was an occupation. General Eisenhower represented the United States. There were, however, three other occupying nations. Great Britain, France, and Russia. Germany was to be given a chance to become a peaceful member of the community of nations. They agreed that Germany was to be unified and given a peace treaty at the earliest possible date. In the American, British and French zones of Germany, there were free elections. The people voted for a government of their own choice. The ballots counted. Responsibility of government was given to German officials. There was the destruction of many years to rebuild. And the Western nations spent billions of dollars to help Germany back on her feet. 
as in the rest of Europe. Ships, docks, trains, and bridges had been shattered. The German people needed homes, clothes, and food. They needed coal for heat and machines to dig coal. They needed coal to make steel and steel to dig coal. And the American people helped. They brought food. They didn't come as conquerors. They came to work for peace. What happened in East Germany, which was occupied by the Russians? German youth was taught to march with banners and to swear blind obedience to Moscow. The Russians promised to work for a unified Germany and to give her a peace treaty. Instead, they taught German youth to fight and riot so there can be no unity and no peace except on Russian terms. In 1948, the Russians tried to force the Western nations out of Berlin. They closed all means of transportation to starve the people into submission. But the Russians couldn't close the airways. For 13 months, American and British planes flew in supplies to help a city keep alive. The Russians were losing face before the world, and they abandoned the Berlin blockade. Finally, let us see what happened in Japan. When the Americans first landed in the Japanese islands, there was a great deal of fear in Japanese hearts that the Americans came as conquerors to enslave them. Instead, the Americans came to help Japan back to the ways of peace. Working with Japanese representatives, Food was brought from the United States. The main problem was to help the Japanese people to help themselves. There was much to be done. It takes many factories to build machines like these. Yet machines like these are needed if Japan is to have prosperity. Coal, oil, copper, steel, rubber, and cotton are needed. And the American people have helped with supplies, machines, and technical help. The Japanese people have performed many miracles in rebuilding what war destroyed. It takes a lot of skill to build a ship or to make steel. And it takes a lot of time to heal the scars of war. There's a whole generation of young people who need training in the ways of peace. Schools and teachers are needed. American technicians have helped. American educators have trained Japanese teachers in democratic processes. 
to guard the health of the Japanese people, many more nurses are needed. American nurses have been sent to Japan to help train them. After a war, there is danger of epidemics, typhus, malaria, cholera, tuberculosis. Equipment, drugs, hospitals, nurses, and doctors are needed. The American people have sent this help. Working together, Japanese and American doctors and nurses have done a heroic job. A democracy is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. They keep it that way by free elections. As in Western Germany, the American occupation had a single purpose, to help the people back to peace under a government of their own choosing. The Japanese people have come a long way in a few years. They have good reason to be proud. Americans believe that Japan has earned the right to a peace treaty. This was the purpose of the recent visits to Japan by John Foster Dulles. Ambassador Dulles went to Japan to explore the terms of a treaty which would bring Japan back into the fellowship of nations seeking peace through collective security. peace settlement stated Ambassador Dulles should restore Japan to a position of dignity and equality among nations. Returning home, Ambassador Dulles said, American policy for Asia can be put in one word, peace. But peace, said Ambassador Dulles, has been slow in coming because another great power talks peace and promotes war. Russia will not join in a peace treaty for Japan, said Jacob Malik, Russian spokesman. His bestia, official Soviet government paper, bitterly attacked the United States for seeking a peace treaty with Japan. Stalin, over 25 years ago, outlined the strategy of victory over the West through revolution in the East. The Soviet leaders saw that Chinese manpower would be good fuel for the furnace of violence they sought. Early in 1950, the first step in this new expansion was planned, an attack on South Korea. North Korean communists were summoned to Moscow, and an attack on the Republic of Korea was planned. A North Korean army was trained by the Russian military and they were supplied with Russian planes, Russian tanks, and Russian guns. And while this was going on, the Russian leaders kept telling the world they worked for peace. On 
unprovoked, the communists attacked South Korea, and the United Nations went to her aid. The communist design of violent revolution was revealed in November 1950. The Chinese communists joined in open attack on the United Nations troops. Against all this, concluded Ambassador Dulles, stands the American effort for peace. This, the Japanese people have seen with their own eyes. The plans for a peace treaty for Japan go forward. The American people will persist until this purpose is achieved. They look forward to a peace of trust and opportunity. A treaty which will remove the moral scars of war and restore Japan as an equal in the community of nations. A treaty of peace that will give the young ones everywhere a more secure, and happier life. This is the American will for peace. <laughs>